morning in chapter 12 and verse 1, I can't believe it. Have you ever been in the midst of a thought that was so real and so strong that when you awoke, you said, I can't believe it. Well, now, I have to admit, there have been some of those for me that when I woke up, I was glad it wasn't real. <laughs> uh, we call those nightmares. But sometimes we actually see God doing for us what is a miracle, only to wake up in our reality, in our history, and say, I can't believe it. But what must it be like? to be standing in a lonely street in the middle of the morning and seeing an angel disappear in your very presence and realize only moments ago you were shackled. Can you hear Peter say, I can't believe it. You know, I can't believe it is a phrase that's found in a lot of places. And as we read through the text today and come back to the sermon itself, we're going to find at least three places where that phrase was used for different reasons. But begin reading with me in verse 1 of chapter 12 in the book of Acts. It says, it was about the time that King Herod, now there were a number of them, most of us know Herod the Great, uh, the one who was on the throne when the babies were killed, uh, the one who had John the Baptist beheaded. But this is King Agrippa. He only served from 42 to 44 B.C. And so we know exactly when this is occurring. And so it's in the time of King Herod that he has arrested some who belong to the church. The ecclesia and ecclesia, as those two words come to us, uh, those who have been called out. Did you realize believers today that when you and I see ourselves as the body of Christ, as the ecclesia, that means the called out ones. We've been called out from a world of darkness to serve in God's world of light. And there were some folks in that church, just like you and I are in his church today. I don't mean this building, I mean in the body of Christ. And they were being persecuted. In fact, Herod had secured James, the Lord's, not the Lord's brother, but John's brother. Now, if you remember in your reading of the New Testament text, there were three men of the twelve that were always with Jesus. In every single grouping of the twelve disciples, they are always first. And in each of the major epics of the life and ministry of Jesus, they're present. Peter, James, and John. And this is James, the brother of John. And Herod has seized him along with others who I am certain were killed as well, but he has been put to the sword or he was beheaded. He becomes the first of the apostles of those 12 men of our Lord to give his life for the cause. And I am reminded of his mom as it's put on her lips in one narrative and of the disciples themselves in another as they asked Jesus if they could sit John and James, one at his right and one at his left. And he asked them, are you able to be baptized with the baptism with which I've been baptized. And they said, yes, Lord, we are. And yes, James did. And here James is put to the sword. He's the brother of John. Now, when Herod saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter. Now, what do you think his intentions were? When he sees Peter, if he saw that killing James pleased the Jews. And don't think for a minute 
that it didn't ring in Peter's ears the words of the Lord about him following in death as well. He didn't know he was going to die one day years later upside down on a cross. He just knew that he was going to die a martyr's death for the Lord. And they've already taken this other that's in the fishing business with him and took his head, and now they take him, and he knows it's to please the Jews who were in the palace area of Herod. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which precedes Passover. And after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to the guards to be guarded by four squads of four. Now, what they do is they change out four times in 24 hours. And they use four people to guard one person. Two stand outside, two are shackled to him on the inside. Now, why would you suppose that Herod would do this? Well, he's already walked out once. He wanted to be sure that it didn't occur again. And so he shackles them with two guards and puts two sentries, and has them changed four times in a 24-hour period. He wants to be absolutely certain that nothing unusual occurs in this prison. So Peter was kept in prison, verse 5. And I like the strong transition, but the church was earnestly praying. Peter's in prison, but the church is praying. Now, folks, don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. When the church begins to pray, things begin to happen. Have you ever noticed when there were crises in your life and you begin in earnest prayer to seek God that things begin to happen? Well, they knew the severity and the seriousness of Peter's imprisonment. They knew the necessity of his leadership. And in earnest prayer, they lifted him before God. Verse 6 said, the, light, the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, so he's been in there several days, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, And the other two sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side. Now, this word is the word to smote. Uh, It's the same ability that could take a life, but here it just awakes Peter from his sleep. And... He smokes him on the side to wake him up. Quick, get up. Now, there are several ups right here. Get up, gird up, shoe up, and coat up. Now, I think what he's trying to say is, you need to get yourself together. We're getting out of here right now. You know? And so, he says, get up. And as soon as he got up, the chains fell off of the risk of Peter. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And Peter says, absolutely. <laughs> now, it's not in there, but I'm thinking he's, he's, he's about to wait to get it, right? Well, not really. Peter followed him out of the prison. But he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. Now, here's where we started. This is where you wake up to a miracle. It's not where you think a miracle is occurring and wake up and know it was a dream. This is where he thinks he's dreaming, and he wakes up, and there's actually a miracle happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them. You think he said open sesame or something? I don't know what happened. 
But I mean, whatever the angel commanded, those iron doors just opened. And they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, now that's why I said he was standing out in the middle of the morning in a small street. Suddenly the angel left him. And then Peter came to himself. That's when he realized it wasn't a dream. He was what? Awake. And a miracle had indeed occurred. Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. Another beheading. When this had, drawn, had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, so also called Mark, or John Mark as we know him, where many people had gathered and were praying. Now we can tell by the words that follow that this is a family of means because they have a house with a courtyard and a gate. It says, Peter knocked on the outer entrance. And a servant girl named Rhoda. Now, she is uh, the rose. Did you know that's what that word means? And she's a servant. But she's treated like a family member. And they're praying. And she hears the knock and she goes to the door. And she answered the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back and left him standing outside, knocking. In the middle of the morning, knowing that it wouldn't be long till they would recognize that he was gone and they would be looking for him. Now, I'm trying to just fill in some of the things it doesn't say, but are in fact going on. She announces to the group praying at the house, Peter is at the door. They said, you're crazy. This sounds like Baptist prayer meetings. God, heal this person. God, help this person. And somebody comes to the door and says, God just healed. Oh, hush, we're praying in here. Leave us alone. Have you lost your mind? You don't interrupt a prayer meeting. You've lost your mind, they told her. And when she kept insisting, bless her heart, she wasn't going to give up. This girl was stubborn. She kept insisting. They said, well, it must be his angel. <laughs> but Peter, thank God, kept knocking. I don't know if he was taking those words of Jesus literally, you know, ask, keep on asking, knock, keep on knocking, seek, keep on seek. But I tell you what, if I know guards are coming after me and I've miraculously been put out of prison and I'm standing in the middle of the morning hours at the only safe haven I know and they haven't opened the door, I'm going to keep knocking. Amen? Amen? I don't think I'm by myself. Okay. So Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him. They were astonished. Peter men motioned with his hand for them to be quiet. <laughs> and, you know, we don't need to stir up a whole lot of ruckus at this time in the morning. They don't even know a mouse yet. Shh! And then he told them about how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this. And this would be James, the Lord's brother, about this, he said. And then he left for another place. <laughs> I, I, if you don't see the humor in that, I'm just sorry. <laughs> you know, there has been entirely too much commotion here. This is, this is no longer a safe place. I just want you to know I'm out. And I am certain he probably told none of them where he went. Uh, you can't tell what you don't know. And there we come to the end of our text for today. I can't believe it. Are there things like that that happened in your life that you just say, I just can't believe it? Pray with me. Father, we are so slow to receive what you have said 
and promised. Forgive us in the midst of our astonishment for saying again and again, I can't believe it. Lord, help us start believing it. For in the belief of that, we tap into the resource that you have made available to us through your Son. The one that Paul spoke about when he said, Will you not truly give us everything we need? Lord, help us today to not only ask, but ask believing and knowing that you will do for us that miracle that we need. And then, Father, help us when we receive it to just say, praise God. I knew it would happen. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We find ourselves today in the text in three different places. The first place is the palace. In the palace, we have three groups of people being considered. The first group of people that are being considered are the Romans. Herod had great desire to please Rome. He did not have the prominence and the power that he believed he should have. And so as a result, there was a precariousness. He knew how quickly power could come and go and how quickly prominence rose and fell with the Romans. And so he sought a political persuasion to keep Rome on his good side. He already is aware that there are believers in Caesarea, for he knew about what went on at Cornelius' house. And he is aware of what took place in Antioch and the extreme explosion that was taking place in the third largest city in the Roman world. And he thought, if I can do something to put aside or to slow down this Christian movement, then I will certainly have the favor of Rome. And so he collects up believers, people who are a part of the called out ones, and he begins to take lives, and especially he announces the life of one of those 12 that followed Jesus when he took the head of James. Now, James was not the first to be martyred. In fact, the first person to die who was a believer was the thief on the cross. And the second person to die who had put their faith and trust in Jesus was Stephen. And now the first apostle loses his life. This pleased the Romans. Now, not only did it please the Romans, but we find in our text this morning, in verse 3, that it pleased the Jews. He saw that it pleased the Jews. And so he proceeds to do more of what he's been doing. And who better to get than the fellow at the top? And so he seizes Peter. The Jews certainly rejoiced over James' death. He was one of the key leaders, but what better than that? than to see Peter's life lost. And when Herod Agrippa realized that his actions had pleased both the Romans and the Jews, you can hear him say, I can't believe it. It worked. It worked. But there was a third group, the Christians. The Christians who were faithfully proclaiming the good news of the gospel. The Christians who, because of their proclamation, are being persecuted. The Christians believe it and pray. The second group, or second place, in verses 5 and following, is prison. 
having the unbelievable effect that his orders had procured, now Peter is in prison. Verse 5 tells us, so Peter was kept in prison. He was kept because in honor of the Jews, he would not bring a death penalty to one in the midst of Holy Week, those days preceding the Passover. He had full intention following Passover to take the life of Peter. And the night before it could occur, the angel of the Lord appears. Now, in the prison, there are 16 men chosen, handpicked by Herod to oversee the imprisonment of Peter. Each of them are given their shift. We find this going on between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. Now, I don't know about you, but I never liked that shift. Uh, that is the one where if you ever lost vigilance, you lose it. I don't think God made us to be awake at night. And certainly, uh, even if you like nighttime, once it gets about 1, 2 in the morning, if you're normal, you're sleepy. Now, some of us have become very abnormal, I've learned in my age, uh, that uh, there aren't any hours that, that really work like they should anymore. But for most of us, you know, 3 to 6 in the mornings. uh a time when most of us, if we're not asleep, we wish we were. And these are the four who are guarding Peter. And two are shackled. And two are standing guard outside the cell. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't other soldiers and other prisoners in the cell block. These four specifically assigned to this one task. Because you remember... This happened just shortly before, and somehow, mysteriously, Peter walked right out. And Herod was going to be sure that didn't happen again, so he used the guards at the prison. Now, one of the amazing things in verse 7 that I find is that as Peter is in the prison, Peter knows that that moment is coming. He knows that it is brief between now and when Herod is going to do what he seized him to do. What is Peter doing? Did y'all read that? Well, you at least heard it. I read it to you. What is he doing? He's asleep. I don't mean just asleep. He's so much asleep that he has to be smoted to be woke up. Now, you know, I don't know that I ever sleep that deep. But I know some folks who do. I won't call any names, but I know some folks who do. Don't you, Kathy? <laughs> and, and, you know, uh, I find it an amazing statement of faith and belief on Peter's part, don't you? That he is asleep, sound asleep. Chained to two guards. And then, of course, there is the angel. It doesn't tell us which angel, but given the text, most probably Michael. And Michael comes over, and, you know, I think he probably just used his thumb and it poked him right in the rib cage. Get up! Get up! <laughs> Peter is so asleep, he, 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 he's up, but he's not really sure he's awake. Get up. And Peter thinks, what's going on here? He said, put on your shoes. Put on, wrap yourself up. Put your coat on. We're leaving this place. Get up. Well, you know, Peter finally gets to his feet, and they begin to make their way, and the minute he stands up, the chains fall off. He wraps the girdle around his waist and girds himself, makes him ready for motion, puts his coat on, puts his shoes on, and as they start out, the doors just open. Now, the only time I've ever seen that happen in prison 
is when I went in as a chaplain and somebody was over there pushing the button because as soon as I walked through, it shut right behind me. But they didn't have that kind of contraption. And the doors open, and Peter follows this angel right out through the guards that are standing outside the door. And who else? We don't know, but many other folks. And right out the main gate coming into the place where the prison is, and then off down a small side street. And all of a sudden, he disappears. And Peter says, what? Oh, come on, y'all. I, I worked hard on getting this. I, I can't believe it. <laughs> now, his I can't believe it was probably a little different than the two guys who realized that that person who was chained to them is no longer chained to them because when they said, I can't believe it, it meant their life. In fact, we'll find out next week that the guards' lives were taken. Now, it doesn't tell us if he took all 16, but my guess is the four guys that were on that shift didn't make the next one. Herod was torqued. And Herod said, given four shifts of four soldiers to enshackle one fisherman, what? I can't believe it. Well, there is a third place. The palace. The prison? Anybody want to guess? Since you know it's going to start with a P, right? <laughs> the prayer meeting. They're in John Mark's mother's house. They're at Mary's house. Very possibly where the Lord's Supper took place. A prominent house right there in the city. And... They've been praying all night. And I don't know what they were praying, but my guess is they probably prayed the Lord's Prayer, wouldn't you guess? Because when Jesus was asked, you know, teach us to pray, and he said, pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our Trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. Don't let us get into that place where we can be destroyed. I had that question come up from one of the Sunday school classes last week. Jesus, God, doesn't tempt anybody. The word tempt and the word test is the same word in the Greek. And the context determines the translation. And when you're praying, lead us not into temptation. You're simply asking God not to allow you to be taken to a place where the evil one can bring about his destructive manner on you and in your life. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, what, from the evil one. Because he's the one who wants to put you into temptation and destroy you. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. So what's going on in the prayer meeting? <coughs> Barry, I should have had you do this, but I'm going to do it myself. Say these words with me. When you pray, will you pray for me? For I need your love and your care. When I pray... I will pray for you. I will mention your name in my prayer. Now let's see how good your memory is. Sing with me. When you pray, will you pray for me? For I need your love and your care. Then we answer, when I pray, I will pray for you. I will mention your name in my prayer. Now, I don't know if they were singing that song, but I think they were praying something like that. I think they had prayed the Lord's Prayer. I think that, have you ever prayed that long? I mean, you run out of things to do that you fall under the categorization in your mind of as prayer. I think some of them probably fell asleep. But thank God the rose was up. And she heard Peter knocking. 
What were they praying for? They were praying for the saints. They wanted God's will done through his church. They were praying for sinners, those who had done things against them. And I think that included Herod and the guards and everything that had occurred. They were offering forgiveness. They were praying specifically for God's servant, Peter, who had been seized and put in prison. And then when Rhoda knocked, Heard the knock on the door, and she announces to the prayer group, it's Peter. (laughs) What did they say? Well, believe this. You have lost your mind. Well, isn't it interesting? The chains fell off, and the angel and Peter walked out. And though it seemed like a dream, Peter woke up to a miracle. Now, Barry, every once in a while, I go back and pick up something, and I'm just not real sure what it is. And when it was this song that we sang, uh, for whatever reason in the tradition and the place where I was raised, we didn't get this song. Lead me, guide me. But you know, I listened and I turned around and I looked during our singing of that song and many of you have heard it. But this is what amazed me and and I'm not really trying to give any commentary uh, or personal observation on Elvis. But uh, you know when I went to YouTube Elvis is one of the ones that actually sang this song on a regular basis. And It wasn't just that he sang the song. It was what he said about the singing of the song. Now, here he is in that, you remember remember those crazy-looking glasses, and he he put on weight, and he had that big old belt, and I mean, he just looked gaudy to me, you know. And and, and here he is on this kind of a a YouTube catch, or somebody probably did it on a, on a, a video camera, And he says, you know, sometimes when you just need to be connected, this song helps. And then he and his vocal group stood around the piano player. And I know you listened to it, Barry, because you sang it like you sang it. And they sang this song, Lead Me, Guide Me Along the Way. For if you lead me, I can't stray. Lord, let me walk each day with thee. Lead me, O Lord, lead me. Now that's the course, but two of the things that I found interesting. I'm weak. And I need thy strength and thy power to help me over my darkest hour. Lead me through the darkness, thy face to see. Lead me, O Lord, lead me. Do the times get dark sometimes for you? Are there times when you feel that you're totally alone? And like this songwriter, and like Elvis, who experienced a lot of darkness, to get centered, he said, he would sing this song. I'm lost if you take your hand from me. I'm blind without thy light to see. Lord, Just always to me, thy servant be. Lead me, O Lord. Lead me. Folks, I believe that. Pray with me. Father, today, help us.